Hello everyone, as always, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Open Source Software Development. I hope everyone's staying safe and well out there. Today I'm gonna to talk about one of my pet topics, a topic that I talk about a lot, debugging. I think it's a particularly relevant topic to open source development because open source development is very code centric because the code is the central artifact and because we don't spend a lot of time on front end activities before we start writing that code we're going to spend a little more time debugging and so it's important given all that that we understand how to do it properly so let's dive in and talk about this uh, a little bit and let's start with sort of, well, what do I mean by debugging? It's one of those terms that I think everybody kind of has a feeling for it by now if they've been doing computing for a while, but it's a little bit fuzzy. It's a phase that, you know, if you take a software engineering class, you'll end up with talking about requirements and design and implementation and VNV and maintenance. Those are the five phases of software development, but Debugging doesn't even get listed in those phases, yet it's a lot. It's a lot of what we do when we're building real software. So it's a phase that typically starts during or after coding, more likely during than after, and it finishes before, during, or after the testing phase. The finishes, it'll continue through the maintenance phase periodically as well. The idea is to bring the program to a state where it appears to be bug free. That's, we're removing bugs, debugging, and therefore when we're done, we'll have bug free code, right? But of course, I use the word appears to be on purpose. We never actually get programs of any size or complexity bug free, but we can at least try. We can at least take a shot at it. Usually it's sort of 20, 40% to 40% of the programming effort as a rule of thumb. You know, typically we say that 60% is spent on front-end activities, requirements and design, 40% is spent on back-end activities, that's testing and you know, implementation, about 20% each. That's Those are good rules of thumb, except it discounts that there's another 20% to 40% that's the time spent debugging that people forget to account for because there's no real debugging phase, it's just a thing that you do. And so that's part of why we need to be really careful about our scheduling, we need to allow time to debug our code. And one of the weird things about debugging is that because, you know, like I've been hinting at here, it's sort of a secret process. Secret's the wrong word, but I don't know any great books on debugging. If you look on a, in a book, on programming, it typically doesn't even have a chapter entitled debugging. There aren't sort of well-respected notes out there about how to debug programs. It's almost as though it's just something you have to figure out for yourself. Maybe you, if you're lucky, you'll have a debugger's manual. Yeah. So how do we do it? I mean, it's easy to sit and whine that nobody tells you how to do it, but let's fix that and tell you how to do it. Here's the process that I, I use and that I recommend for debugging your program. First of all, let's talk about failure. What do I mean by a failure? Uh, the IEEE uses a terminology where there's a failure of your software. That is, the software doesn't do what you expected or wanted it to. Maybe that means that it crashes. That's a very common kind of failure, but it may also just mean that it produces a wrong answer. It may mean that it doesn't produce an answer in time. Uh, whatever it we were expecting it to do, it did something different. That's a failure. Failures are caused by faults. Faults are bugs. Faults are defects in implementation that cause the failures to happen. For every failure, there is at least one fault causing that failure. There are a whole bunch of other faults in your program that don't haven't yet caused an observed failure and so they're just bugs that are sitting in your program waiting to be discovered that's a good topic to lead us into vnv later uh but that's not the end of the story faults are caused by what the ieee calls errors mistakes mistakes are things that are essentially 100 percent of the time produced by a human humans make mistakes and so if all programmers were perfect, 
there would be no mistakes, there would be no faults, there would be no failures, and our software would be perfect. But of course, humans are human. And one of the annoying things in software development is watching generations of people grow up thinking they or whoever their heroes are are better than that and won't make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. So here's the debugging process. Find the fault, the bug, that leads to an observed failure. Find the root causes, the mistakes, the errors that led to those faults. Now you understand what's going on and then and only then do I figure out and apply a repair. Remove the fault and check the repair. Does the fault removal fix the failures? Because it's really easy to think you've fixed a bug when you actually haven't. Also, did the bug fix cause new failures? And that again is very common. My bug is gone, but there's a whole new class of bugs, of faults. There's a whole new class of failures caused by the faulty code I've introduced to fix my failure. And the key activity here, really, it starts with diagnosis. And diagnosis is hard, but it's something we do all the time. It's a skill, and it's a learnable skill. If you're a doctor, you learn to diagnose illnesses. If you are a car mechanic, you learn to diagnose car problems. It doesn't work the way I want. What's going on? What can I do about it? That's just diagnosis. And diagnosis is classic scientific method stuff. If you believe in science at all, here's where you'd be applying it. We're going to do a method called hypothesis formation and testing. What's a hypothesis? A guess, an idea about what might be wrong. Yeah, you observe symptoms, right? You observe the failure, you observe the behavior of the failing software, and you ask, well, what might cause that? And if you're at all creative and you're at all smart, you might think up a lot of reasons why that failure could be occurring due to bugs in the software. And so to the extent that you have a bunch of reasons that might be the cause, you need to look really carefully at what you observe, at what's failed, at what doesn't fail, at what the symptoms are otherwise, and eliminate as many of those hypotheses as possible. You want to narrow it down, right? If you have two hypotheses left, you still haven't diagnosed the problem. If you have zero hypotheses left, you really haven't diagnosed the problem. You need to now go find more hypotheses. If you have one hypothesis left, maybe, maybe we've found our problem. Maybe we've done our diagnosis. But in that situation, we don't just stop. We actually try to find confirming evidence, right, that this hypothesis is right. We also look for disconfirming evidence. We look really hard to find out, and this is part of the scientific method, we look really hard to find out to eliminate our hypothesis. We only were down to one, let's get down to zero again. And when we've looked really hard, we can't find anything that rules it out, we see some things that tend to confirm it, then we act on that hypothesis. We, we treat the hypothesis confirmed. Notice that gathering evidence is hard. There's a lot to look at when you look at a running computer program, just like there's a lot to look at with a car or a person. What do you see? What's being print printed when the program compiles? Are there error messages? Are there status messages and stuff when the program compiles? What about when you run it? Are you seeing warnings, error messages? Are things happening? Is the output what you expect it to be? Are things being output that you didn't expect? Are things not being output that you did expect? What's the timing like? Are there long pauses you didn't expect? Does the program run much, much faster than you expected? When I teach a class where we build chess programs, that's a common 
easy diagnosis for me. Somebody comes in and says, wow, my program runs really fast. It's like a hundred times faster than you said it was gonna be. And I'm like, well, then it's buggy. Uh, you know, almost for sure, because the I know how fast the algorithm is supposed to run and too fast means that something's probably wrong. And when they come in with, it's buggy, but it goes really fast, I'll be like, well, what does the fact that it goes really fast tell you about the bug? It probably means you missed some search somewhere. And not just, what does the program do when you immediately interact with it, but what are the side effects? Does it leave files lying around? Does it slow the rest of the system down? Does the system seem to run out of memory? You know, these are things you should be paying attention to. And so you do your observation. We're gonna play Sherlock Holmes here and we're gonna sort of observe as much as we can about what actually is happening with the program. And we're gonna do what's called analysis. We're gonna think about what do you know? How should the system work? What kinds of bugs should be expected? What kinds of things might be wrong? And if you do this well, most of the time, you can diagnose a bug without anything other than staring at the program and its behavior, thinking about what you understand about the source code, and narrowing things down until you understand what's going on. Uh, my notes here say psychic debugging. This is a game I have played over the years, sort of inadvertently. Every once in a while, it used to be more common than it is today, students would send me an email that said, hey Bart, my program's broke, can you tell me how to fix it? And that would be the entirety of the, con of the question. And so now I have to think, what class are we in? What program are they working on or likely working on? What point in the program are they likely to be at given where we are? <coughs> what are the common bugs in that kind of program? What kinds of things might they be seeing? What do I know about them? And I would think about all that and about 60% of the time, and I would write back and I would say, oh yeah, probably, you know, you didn't get this recursion quite right here. You, It's really easy to be off by one. I was right probably, six, I've been right about probably 60% of the time over the years. I've correctly psychically debugged the student's program with no more information than that. The funniest part is I've never, I've gotten thank yous I've never got any student be surprised who did that. They'd write in and say, can you tell me how to fix my program? So I'd tell them how to fix their program and they'd say thank you. Never occurred to them that I was doing anything difficult. And in a way I wasn't. Because if you observe what's going on and you think about it, that's often all you need to do. So in the interest of keeping this under an hour, I'm gonna move on. I have some other stories I could tell, but I do wanna get through this before you all fall asleep here. So here's a few random debugging tips really quickly. First of all, prepare your code for debugging. Uh, if it isn't ready to debug, then you shouldn't even try. You should go back and get it debuggable before you start. Comments absolutely essential. You should absolutely ha take notes within your program enough so that you understand, or the program you're trying to debugs, enough so that you understand what it's actually doing. Uh, this is super important. The code should have a specification. You should know what the program's supposed to do. One of the classic difficult kinds of debugging is when your spec is wrong. I've lost literally days on a single bug where the program was actually producing correct output, but my spec was wrong and I didn't understand that. And I spent a lot of time trying to fix my bug. And every time I'd try to fix it, some other bug would appear and blah, blah, blah. And so finally I would give up on fixing it and stare at it and go, oh, right, right. There was not actually any bug. Don't put yourself in that position. It's really easy to do. You should have a specification. You should have some tests. Because like I say, not only do you want to confirm that the bug you found is gone, the, the fault that you found has disappeared, but you want to make sure that you haven't broken anything else in the process. You should have pseudocode for anything interesting so that you can actually look at something more interesting than lines of code in some gloopy language. You can look at what is this code trying to do. You absolutely have to do all the formatting things. 
I'm really happy to be working in Rust and Python these days. Python enforces at least indentation on you. Rust is better. Rust's got a tool called Rust Format that everybody uses that sort of, when you run it, forces your code into a format that's essentially the community's approved format. And that's really, really useful. Even if it isn't exactly the format I would have chosen, it's, you know, indentation is consistent, uh, the white space use is consistent, and so it's a lot easier to read. Loops, that kind of thing are structured in multiple ways. Pick good names. We've been saying it since CS101, and, you know, it's still true. Pick good names. Uh, finally, instrument your code. What is instrumentation? Well, on your car's dashboard or is what's called the instrument panel. And what's on the instrument panel is a bunch of stuff showing how your car is operating. There's an old joke floating around from somebody about the uh, Ken Thompson car. Ken Thompson very famously said about the ad editor that, you know, it had one message, question mark, but that should be enough. You know, the experienced programmer will understand what's wrong. And the in the in the Ken Thompson car, there's only one instrument on the panel. It's a big question mark on the top of the dash. And when it lights up, you know, the experienced driver will know what is wrong. And, you know, that's, that's kind of bad, but it's kind of also how we tend to program. From the very beginning, if you think some, some of the operation of the program is going to be difficult to observe or understand, plan for it. Go ahead and build instrumentation in gratuitously. It doesn't cost that much, and it can be really, really helpful. And before you debug, inspect the code. Look carefully for things that are wrong and unclear. Explain the code to somebody. Have them look at it. Really, a lot of times you should not never get to the point where you have a bug because a proper inspection of code would have found the problem. So like I say, make sure the spec and tests are correct. Don't try to make it pass a test that's, that itself is buggy. Do some white box analysis as you start. What kinds of similar inputs might cause the program to fail in the same way? And so now you've got something else you can choose to explore <coughs> to try to narrow down your hypotheses. You say, well, if this is the bug, then all even numbers should fail. And so then you put in a different even number, and if it succeeds, well, you've just confirmed that hypothesis. That's really valuable. Uh, you think about black box tests. I've found several failures. What do they all have in common, for example? That would be a good kind of black box uh, observation. Again, timing. Timing is a big deal. You really want to pay attention to it. And really, it's... Again, go back to Sherlock Holmes, not the terrible modern movie Sherlock Holmes, but Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle's real one. <coughs> um, think about the fact that, you know, you're operating like those stories are structured. You really want to have all the things taken into account, and if you do, you can get almost everything. Computers are the most deterministic machines excuse me, that we've ever figured out how to build. If you put them in the same state and run the program a thousand times, it will do exactly the same thing a thousand times. That's fantastic. You should be taking advantage of that by doing these observations. So use your brain. You try running the program with various inputs. You think hard about what you want to do. Still can't figure it out. You're out of hypotheses or you have too many hypotheses, can't narrow it down. Stick a print in somewhere that will confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis. Of all the things I didn't enjoy about programming in Haskell, which in some ways is a wonderful language, back when I was doing a lot of it, the thing I enjoyed the least was the essential inability to put in debugging prints. It's really hard. Control flow in Haskell is really confusing. And there was no very practical way to put debugging prints in, and I really miss that. Because most of the time, that's enough. You think about what's going on, and you say, well, in this situation, if, this, if my hypothesis for this failure is correct, then x will be 7 here, and it should be 8. So you put a print, see if it's 7 or 8. That kind of thing can be really powerful. 
And that doesn't mean you just spam instrumentation everywhere. You're like, I'm going to print the value of every variable in the program after every statement. That would be insane. No, it's you have a hypothesis. You, like a doctor, perform a very specific test, stick a very specific printf in a very specific place and try to figure out what is going on. I mean, you can try to trace your program, but it's a really great way to waste a lot of time without learning anything. So unless you're desperate, don't go there. And if you're desperate, probably don't go there either. The main thing is, you know, before you start looking for answers, try to understand what questions. Have things formulated in terms of a hypothesis. And of course, the debugging tool everyone tells you to use, which I, being very old school, am less excited about, is the debugger. I mean, debugger is a terrible misnomer here. It's certainly doesn't debug anything. It's a tool. It helps you debug things, maybe. But what does it do? Well, it kind of gives you the stuff a printf and some breaks and you know little instrumentation your program could do. But it's sort of without having to write instrumentation, you get some instrumentation for free. You can trace your program a statement at a time. You can put a breakpoint and run till it's reached. You can sort of examine and change variable values anytime the program stopped and that's great those are very useful things but debuggers are really fragile they can often change by changing the timing the operation of your program they're hard to use typically the command interfaces or the GUI interfaces whichever are gross the debugger doesn't interact well with things like IO. If you're trying to debug a network protocol, timing there again may be a critical deal, detail, deal. If you're trying to debug something that reads and writes from the terminal, then things get weird really fast. If you're going to use a debugger, again, form a hypothesis, jump into the debugger just long enough to confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis. Think about the minimum thing you'd have to do in the debugger to decide whether your idea about the bug is right. Do that and get out. Long debugger sessions, they're a real waste of time and super misleading. Let's talk a tiny bit about what you might see. There's sort of two basic kinds of common bug. One is just bad control flow. You didn't get your loop is off by one, your while loop doesn't is inverted, things like that. The other one is just the kind of bug where your calculation is just wrong. You have a bad algorithm in the sense that it doesn't produce the output you expected from the input. What are some examples here? Like I say, off by one fence post errors on things like for loops, very common. Copy and paste errors. Anytime you copy and paste code, you're asking for trouble. You know, we, again, we've been harping on this since CS1, but it's not just because it makes the code harder to read, although it does. It's not just because it, you know, it's, the biggest reason is that it really, really can hide bugs. You can change one thing and not the other. The copy and paste can be inappropriate. You know, the copy code may be inappropriate for the place you're going to paste it into. It's dangerous. It's really common to just have a typo, or what I call a thinko, where you make some very trivial, dumb thing. Oh yeah, six times seven, that's 36, right? And then you put it in your program. That's really easy to do. Um, failure to design the spec, Part, maybe because you don't have a spec, but certainly failure to you know, actually build a design that represents your thing. Failure to understand and implement the design, that's really common to say, well, I thought I understood how this algorithm worked until I tried to implement it, and now I'm not so sure. So those are all things that you might run into. Here's the thing I really want to emphasize. If you take one new thing away from this talk, take this. The important thing here is root cause analysis. It's not enough to find the line of code, the fault, the bug that you know, in your program. That line of code is not the bug. The bug is a mistake. That line got there somehow. And it, however it was, it wasn't a good way. That line got to be that way in some bad way. And you really, really want to track down the underlying mistake. What are mistakes? What are the common mistakes? You were sleepy. 
you were under the influence of a controlled substance, you were stressed, you hadn't allowed yourself enough time, you didn't under adequately understand what was going on. Uh, you know, all these things are common. You're gonna have them as programmers. The very best programmers, I've, I've met some of the best programmers literally in the world. They all do these things. I mean, not all of them, but some of them. People make bugs. It's just how software is. And as long as people are writing software, it's how it's gonna be. So, you wanna find out for a bunch of reasons. Once you've found that root cause, first of all, you can do what's called fault propagation. Oh yeah, I wrote that code at three in the morning. Well, what other code did you write at three in the morning? Go back and look at all of it. Because if, it, if you had one bug in there because you were sleepy and stressed, probably you had a few more. And those are free bugs. Getting free bugs out of your program is awesome. Another thing is, once you understand the underlying mistake, you can make sure you don't make it again. Apparently I don't program well after 2 a.m. I should not do that anymore. Those two things are value. Those are the real value of the debugging process. The fact that your program now produces the right answer, eh. The fact that you have a program that's gonna produce the right answer for a whole bunch of cases you didn't even think about and that your future programs are gonna produce more right answers, yeah, 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 those are cool. It's really easy to screw up repairing a bug. That's a thing that happens a lot. You really may need to change the bug, the design revisit the specification, the requirements. Your bug may ultimately come from requirements or design. Some of the worst bugs I've had to deal with have been exactly that. The, literally the requirements were inconsistent or incomplete and I had to fix those. The root cause turned out to be that I'd gotten the requirements wrong. You need to fix it. And then, yeah, you wanna have tests. First of all, anytime you find a failure, you should write a test that fails to make sure that you can reproduce that failure. When you're done, and run the fixed code, that test should pass. And more than that, you should have a, a reasonable size test suite and all that should still pass too. Um, again, error propagation, fault propagation, do that. Uh, I'm not gonna beat on this here, but I really feel strongly about backups. It's really easy when you're debugging to be de debugging a version of the program that isn't even the one that you're running. I've done this, I've watched a lot of other people do it, where you keep changing your code and nothing changes. You're pretty sure you identified the bug and so you fix it and you run your code again, it doesn't fix it at all. And after a half hour, literally, you're like, oh right, the version that I edited isn't the version that I'm running. Can't be there. It's really easy to get the buggy of the fixed version mixed up. All of this is easy. You really have to be using Git. You really don't want to be using backup files, so pay attention. All right, that's most of what I have to tell you about debugging. Here's a couple of last things that I want to emphasize. First of all, don't get stuck. Debugging is an activity you can churn on for hours, days, weeks. That's not productive. There, if you are not making real progress, first of all, check. Use something like Pomodoro, set a timer, or just get good at interrupting yourself every so often and saying, am I making progress? Do I feel like I'm in a better place than I was 15 minutes ago, or am I just spinning and churning? <laughs> Discovering your stuck's really hard because you get in what's called flow state. When you're in flow state, you're thinking about the problem, not thinking about how you're solving it, and that's a disaster in debugging. You really need to be meta. Do what real engineers do outside of computer science and keep a notebook, write in your notebook. You know what one of the secrets of why notebooks are so great is? Because when you write things down, you're now thinking about what you're doing rather than thinking about the problem itself. That's really valuable. If you're stuck, there's a bunch of things you can do. You know, an approach doesn't seem to be working, switch to a completely different approach. Think up a whole other way to try to tackle the bug. Take a break, really important to not work too long in sessions. 20 minutes is probably the longest you can spend debugging before it would be good to stand up, walk away from your computer and do something else for a while. Ask for help. Uh, skilled, experienced debuggers. 
I think I'm in that rank at this point, are happy to help you debug it. We actually enjoy that. So when you can't, when you get stuck yourself, ask for help with the bug. There's no shame in that. Somebody can try to help you figure out how to do it. And for pity's sakes, if you watch people program and they don't seem to be making bugs, <laughs> they're hiding it from you, they're lying, because they are. Most experienced programmers I know make a lot of bugs. They have a hard time fixing them. And the thing is, if you care, if you actually care to put the time and effort into it, the bugs you make are all fixable. You're never going to make a bug that you just can't fix. You might make a bug that you give up on fixing because it's just not worth it to you, but you'll never make a bug you can't fix. When I was in grad school, some 25 years ago anyway, I took a computer graphics class, wrote a ray tracer in C++. And it had a weird bug. It was such a weird bug. It only happened on some runs and it would subtly corrupt the colors. And, but not a lot. And I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell whether it was a compiler bug bad optimization or something. I couldn't tell whether it was a bug in my code. And if so, I couldn't tell what kind of bug it was. And I spent a long time chasing it and I just gave up. And I was like, yeah, it's C++, it's hard to debug. And every three or four years, I'd get that code out again and poke at it and you know try it with a new compiler version. It would be faster it would, you know, and stuff, but it wouldn't fix the bug. Finally, after probably 15 years, one of my students, who was very good at C++ and was willing to do this kind of thing, I'm like, hey, you know, I've been trying to fix this for like 15 years. You wanna take a look at it? It took him two days to track down a really super subtle memory bug where I wasn't managing memory quite right and it was possible for the thing to render out of partially uninitialized memory. And there was my bug, it was gone. Does that mean I'm an idiot and you shouldn't be listening to anything I say because I'm a terrible programmer? No, it means bugs are hard. And you gotta decide how much effort you wanna put into them. But if you care enough to put effort into them, you'll always solve them. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Thanks for listening, as always. I hope this was helpful. I hope your debugging adventures go well. Again, stay safe and well out there. And I will talk to you again soon.